There is no doubt that he is, but I'm saying I hope that he did it in a way that you can see it. Our ability to come to this place, our ability to sit patiently and humbly to hear the word of the Lord is the beginning of a spiritual journey experience that makes you better than you were the day before. And so when we are preaching the word of God, our prayer is that we too, as we preach, are changed by the word of God. We are not here to dump on you what we already know. We are only here to share an experience. I say these things every time I'm about to preach because I don't want anybody giving me unnecessary authority that I do not have. I heard a teacher say about two weeks ago, he was asked a question in an American circular university. He's a pastor, but he's also an apologist. And he was asked, do you have any authority? And in my mind, I thought he was going to say yes, because he's a pastor. But he said, no, I do not. It is Christ who has authority. It is from his authority that we stand before people and we demonstrate the word of the Lord. But the moment we decide that we are the authority, we fail you. And so that is the thought I want to plant in your head as we get ready to listen to the word of the Lord. Get your Bibles out. It's a new month, but still the same season. We are talking about belonging. For the past two months, we have done our best to demonstrate that belonging is about your relationship with Christ first, then it's your relationship with your brothers and sisters in the faith. But today, I want to take you out of the classroom, out of the church, and I want to put you back where you spend most of your time. That is why last week, Pastor, you spent time talking about Jeremiah and the fact that Jeremiah found a way to belong without becoming. It is interesting that oftentimes we read stories of characters in the Bible and we never understand what God is trying to say. We spiritualize it so much that we treat them as if they are aliens and better than us. But our burden is to demonstrate that they were ordinary people with extraordinary experiences. My choice of character today is somebody I can truly say I do not identify with. And that is Daniel. Don't worry, ladies, next week I'm going to talk about Esther. But today, I want to talk about Daniel. Daniel is a remarkable character because Daniel was not a pastor. Daniel was not a priest. Being a prophet was thrust on him based on the circumstance he was in, but I want you to understand something. Daniel was a regular person. Daniel was more in the world than you will ever be called to be. He lived at a time where the difference between those that believed in God and those that didn't was very stark clear. And so I want to spend some time today, and if you notice, we're not giving you any special titles to the sermons. We're just going to give the name of the character. The sermon is one, be longing without becoming. In John chapter 17, what I consider to be the Lord's Prayer, Jesus prayed a prayer for the disciples to the Father. And one of the things he said was, Father, you have put them in the world. I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that they would not become of the world. And so preachers and teachers have put that sentence into a short statement that says, be in the world, but not of the world. A lot of people take that statement as something negative, meaning that the moment I step outside of the church, I'm in a hostile environment. I'm special because I believe in God and everybody else is unrighteous. That is not what that means. That was an invitation where Jesus is saying, I am sending you into the world. Your assignment is to demonstrate the faith that you claim amongst yourselves. And so, brothers and sisters, for this month, I'm going to do my best together, Pastor Henry, to tell you that, yes, you belong in the hospital corridors. You belong in that accounting firm. You belong in that marketing office. You belong in the business that you're in. Don't stop doing what you're doing and be a pastor. No, no, no. You belong where you are. Just don't become where you are. Amen, somebody? Amen. Get your Bibles out. Get your Bibles out. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel's character is remarkable because we, we are given a record of his life from the time he was a young man, 18 years of age all the way to the age of 90. So when we talk about Daniel, this is not for old people, this is not for young people. By the way, Daniel never retired. 
There was no retirement party for Daniel. He died doing what he loved. Daniel survived three kings doing what he loved. I want to tell you his secret today. Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. I'm going to read all of it, but I'm going to focus on some of it. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps or satraps or regions. Satraps means governor. Darius, like Nebuchadnezzar, had divided the kingdom out into different sections and he had placed men on those positions and strategically they had put people who were from different nations. Daniel finds himself as one of those 120, but beyond that, verse 2 says, and over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one. So not only is Daniel part of the 120, he is part of the top three of the 120. See, when, when you talk to people who are believers, and sometimes they, they are ostrich Christians, an ostrich, when it senses danger, it sticks its head in the sand. A lot of people are comfortable being under the radar, so they will stick their head in the sand. They won't be politicians. They won't be lawyers. They won't be in any government office because they believe those places are unrighteous. But when the elections happen, they complain. Dude, keep reading the text. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps slash governors because an excellent spirit was in him and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. And verse number five says, then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. I'm going to stop right there. That's enough. You go ahead and read to verse 11, but I want to stop right in that moment. In Daniel chapter six, Daniel is estimated to be around the age of 90. He's an old man, but he has not retired. He's still not only in positions of leadership, but he is still dependent upon. He is one of the few characters in the scriptures who is able to not only transcend from one form of leadership, but from one form of government to another. What that means is, under the Babylonians, Daniel rose to leadership under Nebuchadnezzar, under Belteshazzar, and in chapter 5, we are told that the Medes and the Persians come into the kingdom, they take over. Apparently, the reputation that Daniel had up to this moment was so stellar, he could be trusted not only by the Babylonians, but by the kingdom that conquered. Normally, a ruler from a different nation would eliminate, not fire, not retire, eliminate any official from the previous rulership in case of rebellion or a coup. And so they would kill them off. But for some reason, Daniel is kept not only in the kingdom as an advisor, but as somebody in top leadership. But throughout the 70 years that is recorded in the book of Daniel, we find him being faithful from day number one. How does he do it? How does he manage to stay the course? His name was changed by the Babylonians, but he didn't become the thing they said he was. His home was changed. His study was changed. Everything about him was different. See, for Daniel, it didn't matter whether you called him. Pause break. So two weeks ago, I preached a sermon and I spoke about if I was born a month before, I would have been a boomer. Apparently, I was wrong. My sister-in-law took the time to Google and find a large document to correct me. I would not have been a boomer. I would have been a Gen X. I am not that old no matter how gray my hair is. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk to the younger people right now. Just because you are referred to as Gen Z doesn't mean you have to behave as such. Just because you are referred to as a millennial doesn't mean you have to behave as such. What labels are placed upon you is how society feels comfortable identifying you, but if you believe in God, that should not affect you. Amen. 
You don't have to be the thing that people call you. See, when they were out in the streets of Babylon, they were called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But when they were by themselves in prayer, they called each other by their names from back home. Because they did not want to forget where they came from in spite of where they were. And in spite of the fact that Daniel was a round plug in a square hole, he was still wanted around. I, I want to identify three things about Daniel that make him stand out and then I'll, 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 I'll let you go. Because I want you to understand what made Daniel special. The text says in verse number three that Daniel became distinguished. See, in the English language for our generation, we describe distinguished as how you dress. When you dress up in a suit where the tie and the socks and the shoes are matching. When you got the square pocket inside and you're looking like a gentleman with a Rolex on your arm, you, you are referred to as distinguished. But in the Bible, distinguished doesn't mean what you look like or what you have. It talks about the way you carry yourself in society. I have a remarkable brother-in-law. Whenever I have any problems with software, apps, or any technological developments, I always go to him first. I will ask him, is it worth upgrading the phone to this? And he always has something to share with me. Uh, for a long time, he, him and I debated about the, the benefit of chat GPT. He is trying to convince me that I can write my sermons using chat GPT. Now, like I said, I'm, I'm young, but I'm not as young as I used to be. I have a problem with that. I refuse for technology to take over my thoughts, but here's what I did this week. I use it for research and to speed up the process of finding information. Nick, here's what I did this week, man. Normally, when I put in a prompt in, I will, I will keep changing it until it says what I think it should say. But for the first time, bro, the first thing it said, I agreed with. So what I'm about to read is exactly what this version of AI says distinguished means. No editing. You go on your phone, not right now, and type in these words. Define the word distinguished in one paragraph, full stop. Here's what it gave me. To be distinguished as a person means to stand out from the rest in a positive way. It means that you have achieved excellence and are recognized for your accomplishments and character. Being distinguished involves a combination of talent, hard work, and integrity. I'm going to come back to that page. It is not just about achieving success, but also about the way that success is achieved. A distinguished person is someone who is respected and admired by others for their achievements and their character. They are a role model for others and inspire those around them to strive for excellence. So when you read the text that says Daniel became distinguished, it means that he intentionally, cognitively, consciously chose that I am going to be different. Every time he walked out of his house, every time he left his home, from the age of 18 years of age, Daniel and his friends decided we are going to be different. Not weird, different. Not to draw attention, unique. Not for the intention of creating awe and, and pizzazz and sparks. No, just to be different, not for themselves, but for the kingdom. Three things that were said in the previous page I want to go back to. It says talent, hard work, and integrity. Daniel did not succeed in Babylon because he prayed three times a day. Daniel did not succeed in Babylon because he attended worship Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, and Tuesday. Daniel did not become a leader in the kingdom because he read the Sabbath school quarterly. No, Daniel became what he was because he worked hard and he showed up. A lot of the time, preachers will stand here and tell you that you can pray your way through problems. That is a lie. Amen. You don't pray anyway, so go along with me. Daniel is never described in the Bible as conducting Bible studies. Never do we hear that he's going door to door knocking and giving out tracts. No, no, no. Daniel was good at his job. Ladies and gentlemen, it is about time we show up. It is about time we show out. But stop showing off. Daniel knew how to show up, show out. He knew how to not show off. And sometimes he knew when to shut up. He was distinguished, not because he stood out, 
but because he kneeled in the presence of God. He worked hard. He was gifted. He was royalty, but he had integrity. What makes you belong in is your contribution and not your consumption. Oh, rewind, press pause and say it again. What makes you belong is not your consumption, it's your contribution. The problem we have with the people of God is that we spend more time consuming what the world is throwing at us, but we're never contributing anything in return. We are not loud enough with our contributions. We are loud enough with our complaints and our strikes and our complaints and our murmuring and whining, but never with our contribution. From day one, Daniel and his friends decided, we are descendants of royalty. We may be slaves in this country, but we are going to do our best to contribute. Do you know why Daniel did that? Get your Bibles out. This is not part of the word, but it's just part of my process. In, in, in Jeremiah chapter 29, there is a verse that people love to read out of context, where God says, I know the plans I have towards you. Plans of peace to give you an expected end. We like to read that text by itself. But when you read the verses before, God tells them how to conduct themselves in a foreign land. He says to them, when you get there, work hard, produce results, get married, have children, serve the rulers so that they can have profits. Make sure that they prosper because when they prosper, you prosper. When you go to work, don't go there with the intention of wanting to have a Bible study so that somebody becomes an Adventist. Go to work to do your job. See, I know you're like, really? But we're supposed to be missionaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for another sermon. This is today. Daniel showed up. In fact, Daniel and his friends, pastor, they were so focused on being excellent that they were even willing to change their diets. You see, Babylon was a melting pot of diversity of culture. So you can imagine that when those students that enrolled in Babylon U, when they sat down to eat, there was food from everywhere. But instead of eating the food they provided, offered to idols, Daniel and his friends said, give us 10 days of a vegetarian diet and water. And the Bible says they were 10 times smarter. We, we, we're going to talk about that. Uh, how does a 10-day diet make you 10 times smarter? We, we're going to talk about that. Okay, not today. I've tried it. it. Gives you headaches more than anything else. What makes you belong is your contribution and not your consumption. Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel did not have to announce his God. Him showing up did the rest for him. Let's move on. It's not about being different. It's about making a difference. He became distinguished, but also an excellent spirit was in him. Notice it doesn't say he was excellent. It says he had an excellent spirit. Our desire is to be so good at what we do so that people can say, oh man, he's excellent. But for Daniel, he didn't care what people thought. He just conducted himself with the spirit of excellence. There's a difference. He didn't go there because he wanted to make sure that he wouldn't be killed. No, he showed up to produce results. He showed up to be the one who was good at what he did. In fact, one writer says that Daniel was not plagued by the spirit of ambition. Daniel was plagued by the spirit of excellence. People who chase ambition want the result without the work. People who chase excellence are willing to do the work. In fact, they love the process. I've met Doctors, accountants, nurses, lawyers, all four jobs, I can never do them. Dealing with numbers and dealing with uh, uh, law cases from 10 years ago and looking at, at research papers and going through case studies and social studies and all that kind of stuff, that's not my vibe. But I know people who are excited to do the work. You talk to them about marketing, they get excited about that. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the spirit of excellence. Somebody said what feels like play for you, but hard work for somebody else means you're excellent at what you do. Entitlement is threatened by excellence. See, the Daniel I'm describing had to function in a hostile environment. Daniel chapter 6 tells us that there are 120 rulers. Three of them are chosen. And then out of the three, Darius wants to give Daniel in charge of all of them. 
Meaning, if the plan goes to, to fulfillment, Daniel would be the second most important man in the kingdom. I, I hope you're not thinking about this as a Bible story, but as history. Do you understand that if you go through the history of Babylon, you will find Daniel's name in the, in the leadership structure you will find him in Persia in the leadership structure, not because he prayed and fasted, but because he did a good job. But unfortunately for Daniel, he was a Hebrew. And some people will never look past what they know about you that makes you different from them. And for a while, they tolerated him. I'm going to tell you why in a second. They tolerated him. But now that his excellent spirit was about to make him get promoted, the people get concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to disrupt your Sabbath school and Sunday school story. I am going to change the game right now. Daniel was not thrown in the lion's den because he worshipped God. Daniel was not thrown in the lion's den because he kept the Sabbath. Daniel was not thrown in the lion's den because he worshipped the God of heaven and not the statues around. Daniel was thrown in that hole because he was good at his job. Read the text as it is. What they had to do was find a reason to use against him. They looked at the time he showed up for work. All is on time. They spoke to his team to find fault in him. His team loved him. In fact, they brought him his decaf coffee every single morning. Pastor's way too close for me to be slipping right now. Everybody loved him. His maids, his drivers, everybody loved him. These men said honestly, we've looked at anything to do with the kingdom. We cannot find any fault in him. Because here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. Entitlement always gets threatened by excellence. What do I mean? Entitlement is the establishment. People who've always been there are uncomfortable when something new comes along. And I see this with the older and the younger generation. Why is it that there's a spirit of entitlement when you should be making way for the younger people? Daniel was good at what he did. They could have used it, but instead they wanted to get rid of him. Entitlement is looking at the past. Excellence is looking at the future. If you constantly have to remind people, I'm the pastor, I'm the CEO, I'm the man of the house, you are not excellent, you are entitled. Your excellence should speak for itself and not your position. Amen, somebody. When you are excellent, you never have to announce yourself when you walk in the room. When you are excellent, people will acknowledge you in your absence. When you are excellent, people might hate, what, hate you, but they love what you do. Most people will tolerate you when you need them until God calls you to lead them. See, can you imagine when Daniel and his friends arrived as slaves? The classmates will look at them like, man, we admire you guys. You're out here working so hard. You, you've been taken from home by force. Good for you, man. We hope you succeed. Chapter 2. Daniel gets promoted. Do you think his classmates were happy? See, it's one thing to praise somebody when they need you. It's another thing to praise them when they have to lead you. Daniel wasn't trying to be the man in charge. He wasn't trying to take over. Daniel just wanted to be the best he could be. But somebody saw it and said, you need to be in charge. And for some reasons, the Babylonians had no problem with it. But the Persians said, you are a foreigner. You do not belong in that position. And so the Bible says that they started to come up with an idea. And the idea they came up with, by the way, I'm not even preaching about the lion's den. I don't care about that story. You already know it. I'm telling you how he got there. They decided we need to trap him in his faithfulness. He became distinguished, he had an excellent spirit, but he was also faithful. Let me see if I can remember this, I wrote it down. Three things that made Daniel faithful. Daniel was faithful to the movement. Daniel was faithful to the movement. What do I mean? He's a Hebrew. He doesn't belong in Babylon. No matter what position he has, he's not from there. So he was faithful to representing his people. We see this with his friends in chapter 2. We see this with his friends in chapter 3. We see Daniel showing up in ways that other people would have said, this is not my country. These are not my people. I don't care. I'm going to keep my head down and do me. No, Daniel served them as if he was one of them. He was faithful to the movement because God said, I want to send you into all the world and you will become great and you will make other nations great. 
So he was faithful to the movement. Daniel was also faithful in the moments. In the moments. What does that mean? In chapter 2, all the wise men and the fortune tellers and the people who talk to dead people are being threatened by Nebuchadnezzar because they need to interpret a dream. Daniel was faithful in the moment. In chapter 3, his friends are called upon to worship a statue. They were faithful in the moment. In chapter 5, Daniel is called upon to interpret a, a vision that might upset, upset the king, but he goes ahead anyway because he was faithful in the... In the... He was faithful in the... See, we don't understand that our walk with God is not measured by the big things we do. It's measured by the moments. In the moment, are you faithful? In that moment, because moment by moment creates days, creates weeks, creates years, creates you. But most of all, he was faithful as a mover. As a mover. What does that mean? He was a man of influence. He understood that he had influence. He understood that everybody else was watching him. The locals, the foreigners from 120 different countries were watching him. So he was faithful to the movement. He was faithful as a mover and he was faithful in the moments. Pick the one you are struggling with and pray about it. The world, my brothers and sisters, should hate you for your distinction, for your excellence and faithfulness, not for your conformity, not for your mediocrity, and not your hypocrisy. We are so comfortable with being mediocre because we keep telling ourselves, why should I be good at this job? Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> Pastor, why should I chase a promotion? Jesus is coming soon. Why should I make projections for the company to make more money? Jesus is coming soon. Jesus said, occupy until I come. Because when you're good at what you do, here's what happened. Listen, listen carefully. If you want people to leave you alone, to stop coming at you, whether you are a man, a woman, a boy or a girl, here's what you do. Distinction, excellence and faithfulness make it difficult, not necessarily impossible. These qualities make it difficult for your enemies to disrupt your life. Think about it. If somebody hates you at the office and wants you to get fired, you keep coming late, you keep handing in your assignments late, you students who are Adventists, you want to be given off Saturday from doing exams, but you're getting B's and E's in your exams. How does that make any sense? How are they going to let you go when you're not showing up? Excellence, distinction, and faithfulness will make people admire you even if they hate you. But if you suck at your job, they will get rid of you. You focus on the difficult. Let God deal with the impossible. One of the reasons that Christians have a hard time being out there, being distinct, being excellent, being faithful, is because of fear. Some of you can't even pray for your food in public just in case people know what you are. Some of you have dating profiles. It doesn't even say you love God. It says, I don't even know what it says. I'm not on dating apps. But I know for a fact that your Instagram doesn't call you a Christian. It says something like, uh, a child of the creator, something, something like that. You, you don't want people to know you're a Christian. Yo, I am a Christian. I love Jesus Christ, and I'm waiting for him to come one day. Will you date me? You focus on the difficult, let God deal with the impossible. What is difficult? What is difficult is being taken from your home at the age of 18. That's difficult. What's impossible is surviving a fiery furnace. Let God deal with that. You just show up. What is difficult is being married to a difficult spouse, husband or wife, having difficult, difficult children. What is impossible, God will take care of that. A lot of people burden themselves with the impossible. Deal with the difficult, let God take care of the impossible. Amen, somebody. Amen. Daniel and his friends understood, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you can throw us in the furnace. It doesn't matter. God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will be faithful. That's difficult. Jesus showing up in the furnace, that's impossible. Are you, are, you, are you getting what I'm saying? Doing a job surrounded by haters is difficult. Being hired by one king from a different nation is impossible, but it happens. So one more time, if you want to make it in this life and represent Jesus with faith, distinction, and excellence, do the difficult. Let God take care of the impossible. Amen, somebody. Let's land this plane. Let's end the message. What does Daniel do? 
These men have decided he must go. So they convince Darius, who suffers from a, an ego larger than life. They say to Darius, we will worship you for 30 days. No other gods will be worshipped in the kingdom, only you. See, what they knew is that Daniel and Darius were tight. So they understood we can't get rid of him without the law being involved. In Babylon, a king could make a law and change it. We see Nebuchadnezzar do this in chapter 3. He institutes a law that you should worship the statue when the music plays. But he changes it the same day when the three men are delivered by God. But the Persians, the law was greater than the king. And so for 30 days, you had to worship nobody but Darius. Look at how Daniel responds. Verse number 10. After the document was signed, the Bible says he, he had his windows in his upper chamber opened toward Jerusalem. Let's start right there. Why did he open his windows towards Jerusalem? Was he being a patriot? Was he being faithful to where he came from? Listen to this. Everything about Daniel's life came from a place of obedience. He was good at his job because Jeremiah was told by the Lord. Why did he pray towards Jerusalem? Write this passage down. I hope when I tell you to write something down, you actually do. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 36 to verse 39. Solomon is praying. He has built one of the most magnificent structures ever at that time. The temple in Jerusalem is so beautiful. When other kings and rulers came to visit, they would stop at a distance to admire the beauty of Solomon's temple. While he was praying a dedication prayer, this is what Solomon said in that prayer. O oh Lord, when your people have lived a life of disobedience and they are taken to other nations, may they turn their eyes towards Jerusalem in repentance and in prayer. You will hear their prayers and deliver them. So when Daniel is praying with his eyes towards Jerusalem, here's what Daniel is saying. Lord, forgive us because our disobedience has brought us to this place. But now we look to the future when you will deliver your people and bring them back home. So what Daniel did, instead of focusing on the past, he was focusing on the future. That one day I am a foreigner here, but my people will be back in Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care about physical Jerusalem. I care about the new Jerusalem. As you live your life and the world is pressing you down and oppressing you for what you believe and who you are, don't look around you. Look up to the new Jerusalem because one day God will have his people where they should be. Amen. Amen. Let's end this thing. In his prayer, he knows he's about to get into trouble, but the Bible says he gave thanks to the Lord. How do you pray a prayer of giving thanks when you are surrounded by haters? When you know that people want you to fail, what are you thanking God for? That's easy. I'm a 90-year-old man. I came at the age of 18. I survived Babylon University campus. I survived the leadership of Babylon. I survived the fiery furnace. I survived the Medes and the Persians. I've got a lot to be grateful for because the God who's been for me in the past will be with me right now. Stop complaining when you pray. Start saying thank you when your haters are caving in. One more. It says, as he had done previously. The reason, ladies and gentlemen, that Daniel and his friends were able to pray in the fiery furnace is because they prayed before they got there. The reason that Daniel was able to fall asleep in the lion's den while Darius was troubled in his palace room is because he was already a man of prayer. Stop waiting for trouble to make you pray. Pray anyway. Stop waiting for the job before you pray. Pray anyway. Stop waiting for the wife or the husband before you pray. Pray anyway. Because when good things come, when opportunity comes, when trouble comes, let it find you praying. Excellence is not what you say about yourself. Excellence is not what you tweet or post online. Excellence is not the way people perceive you. Excellence is what is inside of you. You can be an excellent wife. You can be an excellent husband. You can be an excellent parent. People don't have to know that. Just do it. You can be good at your job without posting about it. But please put your CV on LinkedIn. You'll get another job if you do that. But whatever you do, be excellent because it gives you an advantage. Amen, somebody? I'm done. I'm done. Eyes closed. Heads bowed. Let's pray to a God who is distinct, who is excellent, and is ever faithful. Our Father in heaven, 
forgive me for being long-winded and having so many words, but this morning, I just wanted to encourage the saints that when we preach, we're not telling them to, to do less in the world and to do more for the kingdom. Because a lot of the time, when we show up as teachers, when we show up as business people, when we show up as engineers, lawyers, doctors, nurses, secretaries, when we show up as parents, our ability to be excellent and diligent and faithful is what makes us ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven. If we are to be accused by the world, let it not be because we're mediocre and bad at our jobs. Let it not be because we claim one thing and live another. Let it be because of our faithfulness to the God of heaven. I pray for the young people in this room today that they must understand it's not what we show the world. It's not what we demonstrate to the world. It's how we show up and how we live in the world. The world is not an enemy because it doesn't believe in you. The world is an opportunity for us to show who you are. And so, Father, today, there's a young lady, there's a young man who is struggling to belong without becoming. He is doing what the people around him are doing because he says he needs to fit in in order to keep his job. He needs to go out with them in order to keep his job. In order to get the, the account, to get the business, to get, to get the promotion, he needs to do what everybody else is doing. I'm saying, no, you don't. You can show up the way God wants you to, and God will make you succeed. If certain doors are closed, it means that's not the thing. And so I pray that you will help us to be distinct, to be excellent, and to be faithful. If there's anybody struggling with this today, may you help them. Look towards New Jerusalem. Gain motivation. Gain strength. And on Monday morning, let them show up, show out, and be what they need to be. Father, I pray, while we are belonging and trying not to become, watch over us from above. While we are belonging and trying not to become, please lift us up when we fall. While we are trying to belong without becoming, please walk ahead of us and Help us maneuver the landmines that uh, we'll always find in this life. Please surround us to protect us and please be behind us so that when we get discouraged, we can keep moving forward, but above all things, so that we can belong without becoming, be in our hearts. My brothers and sisters, if this is your prayer, let me hear you say amen. God bless you.